This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Go to the link in the description below so they know that I sent you. Hello everyone, this is Nitsa Hone, and welcome to the new podcast that me and Mike from Mythic Tales are doing. Uh, this is our second episode. It's called Limited Recall, and we talk about magic, and we talk about the latest limited formats. It's where the limited part comes from, and we talk about magic's history. That's where the recall part stuff uh, comes from. So... How are you today, Mike? Oh, pretty good. Already swamped in preview season again. <laughs> we barely started and we've already got a new set just dropping right on top of us. It feels like War of the Spark barely came out yesterday. Yeah, that's seems to be the case here. Yeah, as soon as you know, War of the Spark's only been on Arena for like, what, two or three weeks. And now we're talking Modern Horizons. And uh, obviously it's a different kind of set. It's the innovation set this year where it's not a standard legal set and it won't be on Arena at all. So it is different. Maybe it has a different audience, but it is sort of, you know, there's always seems to be one set every year where a bunch of spoiler stuff happens so soon after it that you don't really have time, as much time maybe as we usually do to enjoy the set before we're already thinking about what's next. Yeah, I feel like Battle Bond was like that last year. Dominaria you know, barely came out the door and then Battle Bond had already started up as kind of summer, like spring to summer set. Yeah, yeah. Modern Horizons, uh, which we will talk about today, limited wise, and obviously we're very early on in the in the spoiler season. And so this is like not only like our, our early thoughts, but our really early thoughts about the format. But it does look really interesting for limited. And we'll talk about the archetypes that, you know, the design team has set or in the set for limited and stuff and how fun we think they are and stuff. Um, but it's a weird set in that unlike past sets um, that have been released as the innovation sets or whatever, Modern Horizons is legal. All the cards in it will be legal in modern. Every other innovation set has only been legal in Legacy and Vintage. So this makes this set uh, quite unique compared to things we've seen in the past. Yeah, it's definitely going to be quite interesting. There's been kind of a mixed reaction to the spoilers so far, and I'm definitely not counting out Wizards on this one just yet because there's not nearly the entire set spoiled yet, but definitely a lot of like commander style cards, legacy style cards. And then also just, you know, just a smaller handful than I imagine so far, you know, that seem like they're going to shake up modern. Obviously, we're not a modern podcast, so we're not going to go too deep on that. But I guess we could just start with the fourth cycle. Uh, what do you think about those? Well, my favorite, well, what's interesting to me about the fourth cycle is that I decided to do my top 10, uh, the week we're recording this, the one on Wednesday, on, on uh, pitch spells. And I recorded it on Sunday before the spoilers started dropping. Dropping, and I foolishly asked at the end of the video, do you think we'll ever see new uh, pitch spells? And, and for, if you don't know the terminology, a pitch spell is a spell where you can uh, exile a card from your hand to cast that spell for free. Um, and we've had a lot of them. Force of Will is the most famous of them all. And then like literally later that day, uh, it was revealed that there's a whole cycle of them in Modern Horizons. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the whole force cycle, which, you know, they are referencing force of will there, which is cool. I think it looks pretty interesting. Um, you know, I think some of them are probably more playable than the than the others. The blue one and the green one, I think both look pretty interesting for modern, obviously enough. And I think they'll all have some nice flexibility in limited. Most of them for limited, at least, are still priced like at a somewhat reasonable rate. So being able to cast them for free sometimes and really get your opponent is going to be pretty exciting, I think. Yeah, definitely. You say foolish. I say prophetic. I think you just saw it coming. But <laughs> to be fair, I, really I think did, a lot of though. people... <laughs> I think a lot of people were thinking that there would be something along those lines. Obviously, Force of Will would definitely warp the format. You know, there's a reason nearly every Legacy deck has blue in it, uh, because you kind of need Force of Will to get past a lot of the degenerate combos that Legacy revolves around. But yeah, br Brainstorm and Force of Will make yeah the whole format blue, basically. Yeah, this cycle definitely seems pretty on balance, and I like that it encourages some more fair play, you know, against combo decks, things like that. But again, not super interested as far as modern goes. How would you rank them limited wise? What do you think is the best? How one? would I rank them limited wise? Well, that, which one do I think is the best one in limited? That's a good question. I feel like it's got to be the black one, right? Because you just get to kill a creature, you know, or I guess you are two for one in yourself unless they you know, make multiple or play multiple creatures in the same turn, then you get more even trade. But yeah, I mean, the thing about most of these most uh, pitch spells that we've seen in the past is they're all two for ones, but they're free. So it kind of evens out. I mean, yeah, Force of Despair, the black one probably is the best in limited. You're probably right. I mean, 
the fact you can't kill things with it that have already been in play for a while is kind of annoying. It's not the kind of removal spell you top deck and you're thrilled about. But um, provided that you can, you, it, I mean, if this were three mana without the free clause in it, destroy, you know, all creatures that near the battlefield this turn, it would be pretty good and limited already. The fact that it's also free is sort of, uh, you know, some additional value um, that will make it awesome sometimes. So sometimes you'll be able to two for one your opponent because they play two creatures and you use this. Other times maybe you'll have to two for one yourself to cast it for free and get rid of your opponent's new creature. But the interesting thing about, I think, all of them in Limited is that the fact that they're free is certainly relevant, um, but it's not going to come up quite as much because there are going to be times where you don't want to be, it's not going to be worth it as often in Limited to exile something uh, to two for one yourself, basically, um, as it can be in Constructed, where you you know, you know can do this on a turn, especially you know the free counter spells that are out there. You can do it on a turn where it really is game-breaking, and the game changes utterly at that point. And with a card like Force of Despair, for example, I don't think you'll always be able to just change the game drastically when you do it. Um, but there will be times when you can. And I think that's pretty exciting. Yeah, and it seems like the green one, probably a great sideboard card. You know, if there does end up being, you know, a few more degenerate artifacts, I don't think we've seen anything so far that's super scary in the artifact realm. I mean, there's no, definitely the, uh, the Altar of Despair could be a win condition for decks and... Some things with like constructs and the like, but enchantments as well. Haven't seen anything too crazy. I, I know there mm -hmm. are a couple pretty good enchantments, but again, not a lot that you're going to be wanting to pitch a card to destroy one, if that makes sense. Right. And we should note that at this point, uh, we've seen about 85 cards in the set. So we'll, we don't know the whole set. But yeah, I mean, I assume it'll be a good sideboard card. I think in modern, you know, you know, modern horizons and all that. I think in modern, it'll probably end up being a really uh, powerful sideboard card because there's so many artifact decks that are really good in the format. Um, oh, yeah, it'll be incredible in modern for. Yeah, uh, so I think it'll, make, it'll, be, that, it'll yeah. be one of them that makes an actual immediate impact on modern. I think um, I think several cards from this set will. But if I have to pick one, I, I, Force of Vigor is definitely up there. Now, the white one, I feel like that could actually be pretty darn valuable and limited based on some of the mechanics that we've seen so far. There's definitely like a lot of go wide that I've seen with uh, various token creation. You've got, you know, squirrels that we've seen already and like goblins and elementals yeah. and things like that. And a anthem that you can just cast for free or, you know, even just four mana, four mana glorious anthem is still not the worst yeah, you know, a thing in the world. Well, especially. it's a four mana glorious anthem with flash. So that's already it's already, you know, you can't compare it perfectly with glorious anthem, which doesn't have flash. Sometimes you can flash this in and blow out your opponent, even if you're paying all four mana. Um, but the blowout potential it has is definitely real and limited where sometimes two for one yourself means, you know, killing three of your opponent's creatures and keeping three of yours alive in combat. So, yeah, I mean, I think it'll be pretty nice and limited um, because it's sort of part combat trick, part anthem. Um, and that is not really something we see with any sort of regularity. We've seen effects that put counters on all your creatures at instant speed, but an instant speed anthem is kind of unique. Yeah, that's not something I think I've seen a lot of other than, you know, obviously instance and, and the like. But right. Non-permanent uh, pump or plus one plus one counters is usually what we see. All right, so earlier today, as of when we're recording this, of course, uh, they talked about on stream the 10 archetypes in this format and what they would be in limited. Um, and, you know, like all of these sorts of sets, these, these innovation sets, and this set sort of almost feels like a master's set too, which has sort of been retired. But these formats usually have some pretty well-defined archetypes, and they usually do some things that are pretty unique too. And I think they've definitely delivered there um, on the 10 archetypes. I mean, some of them are things we've seen before, but some of them are takes on things we've never seen before. And some of them are things that, uh, yeah, we, I don't think we've really ever seen. Um, so uh, which of the... 10 archetypes that we now know what they be, do you think uh, sounds the most interesting to you, Mike? I mean, obviously ninjas, but they haven't shown any of them yet. <laughs> so no, just like ninjas to be sneaky and, uh, you know, show up unexpectedly. But I'm guessing maybe next week we'll get those. But second yeah, place is slivers oh. for sure, which is another slivers. great tribal. So. Yeah, I mean, those are two tribes that people have loved that are always begging for more and they're going to get them. Um, and yeah, they'll definitely matter in limited because they're two of the tribal archetypes. And yeah, ninjas showing up late. I'm sure that's going to be a joke. But yeah, apparently on the stream, 
uh, spoilers for Ninjas start tomorrow, which is Friday. So by the time people hear this uh, and are watching this video on YouTube or whatever, we'll know what some of the ninjas are. But in general, you know, ninjas are a pretty cool creature type that only, has only shown up, I think, in like Plane Chase, but originally in Kamigawa block. And they have a cool mechanic called ninjutsu, where if you a creature you control attacks and isn't blocked, you can ninjutsu your creature into play for a mana cost and all the ninjas have an ability that says when this does combat damage to a player something happens so the interesting thing you can do design wise with ninjas is you can have them abuse into the battlefield triggers in limited you know if you you know mana war is a card that's in the set if you attack with that and your opponent doesn't block it and then you ninjutsu in something again we don't know what ninjas are going to be here at this point uh that's some serious value um so that seems like you know it's a tribe that's not just like oh look it's a creature type it's a tribe that has a really interesting character that i think makes for some really interested limited design yeah typically what you'll see is something like curious obsession so like you know when this creature deals damage draw a card or um i believe there's been one that does like a damage you know to a target when when it deals combat damage to a player so be yeah so, cool some we've seen in the past with. Some we've seen in the past that could show up in this set are like uh, uh, Ninja of the Deep Hours, who's one with a curiosity effect, or uh, Miss Blade Shinobi, which has a Mana War effect. Uh, Okiba Gang Shinobi was a black one that makes people discard cards. You know, we've seen, you know, Ink Eyes was a rare one that reanimated something, which obviously that's huge. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're cool effects and it interacts interestingly with the cards you have in your deck that aren't ninjas. So I think that'll be really fun archetype to play after you know it not being a thing since blue black ninjas was an archetype back in kamigawa block and i guess we didn't mention entirely what slivers so slivers are just like the ultimate tribal tribe <laughs> everything usually either every sliver affects all other slivers or uh, they do something along those lines where it buffs other slivers so as an example dragscape sliver which is an uncommon uh, one in the black each sliver creature card in your graveyard has unearthed two uh, and on Earth, you pay the mana cost, and then it comes out of the graveyard with haste, so you can attack with it that turn, and then it gets exiled. So, again, just as an example, it, it usually affects all other slivers, which is kind of awesome. That's part of why they've always been a love, but also hated tribal type in Commander, and I think they even did some work in Standard at uh, some point, didn't they? Yeah, they've intermittently been kind of relevant uh, in the olden days. Uh, like, I think they really made their first debut in in Tempest Block, and yeah, when they first showed up there, they were relevant in Standard. I know in more recently in Modern, people have been trying to use Collected Company with them, which is interesting because you can you know basically flash them into play from your library and give the bonus to your whole team at instant speed. But um, I know I'm going to get a lot of hate for this because there are a lot of sliver lovers out there. But I think slivers are like one of the laziest, most uninteresting tribes around <laughs> just because it's like every one of them is a lord. You know, there's not really any sort of there's nothing interesting to me about that personally. But, you know, I, I know people love it and it is fun that they, you know, all tribes kind of snowball, but they do it to a ridiculous level because they all help each other out. Um, I do think it's interesting that they said that the sliver color pair is red, white. So I guess they're most concentrated there, but we've already seen like the one you just mentioned is black. So I think slivers is maybe five colors, but most concentrated in red, white. It'll be interesting to see what they do with that. Yeah. And obviously we got the flagship, the first sliver, which is... Uber colors so white blue right. black red green you have to pay all five or you know mana so it's not going to be very viable based on what we've seen so far it, i know we haven't seen a lot of color fixing you know aside from uh mox tantalite which we can talk about at a later time but it does give all of your slivers cascade and has cascade itself so <laughs> which is uh, wacky <laughs> yeah which it's just insane cascade when you cast the spell you get to exile cards from the top of your library until you hit something that costs less so in this case until you hit a four mana or lower spell and you get to cast for free and then you put all the other cards back on, in your library so there's a reason a lot of cascade cards were banned at least up until recently like uh blood braid elf. elf yeah again i wouldn't be too worried about that card because that's going to be very hard to cast uh what else do we they have so it looks like they may white. print uh, they may print uh, Jim Hyde sliver or something, though, and then we might be in trouble, which is a sliver that makes all your slivers birds of paradise. So, oh, you know. wow, that's <laughs> that could be pretty crazy. Wait, I guess that's already in modern, so that's not going to happen. They could print the one with a different name, right? Because all the cards in this set are 
not in modern before the printing of this. They're either cards that are older than modern or brand new cards that are legal and modern so uh, yeah exactly yeah i guess jim hide sliver is impossible but maybe a sliver like that which that leads us into red looks like goblins i mean that seems pretty simple <laughs> it's gonna be what is it goblins and convoke for the red black deck yeah um convokes on some white cards too i mean red black is definitely goblins i'm not sure i haven't maybe i haven't seen them yet myself but i haven't seen that much convoke in either of those colors actually but uh, oh sorry there's a there's a black card with convoke that got spoiled today uh as an example of convoke this one's called feaster of fools and it's oh yeah uh, four black black it's a demon it's three three flying and it has convoke where you can tap creatures to pay for the colorless mana and the mana cost and this guy when he enters the battlefield also has devour so he can uh, sacrifice any number of creatures to him and then he gets two counters for each creature he uh, sacrifice so that thing could be a definite bomb when you combine it with something like uh seasoned pyromancer some, yeah some goblins to eat in general <laughs> yeah yeah well, like seasoned said, pyromancer. yeah and he makes elementals so not quite goblins but still you know more of that token go wide you know one one uh right little creature strategy that we're seeing from red and I think Feaster of Fools, along with a lot of the cards we've talked about so far, also illustrates something about this set. It is loaded with mechanics and keyword abilities. I think Morrow said there are as many as 50 <laughs> in this set. So uh, there's a lot of them. Um, this is not like a beginner's set. Um, be prepared for lots of mechanics. Like if you're a newer player that you may not have seen before, they might only appear on like two cards. You know, like Devour isn't exactly a mechanic people have been clamoring for. But combining it with Convoke is a really cool design, and that's not something they could get away with in uh, most sets because they can't have two different, like, you know, all these different keyword abilities. But that's a pretty cool thing about a card like Feaster of Fools. But yeah, Red Black is, yeah, goblins, go whitey kind of thing. You know, there are goblin payoffs that we've already seen. Um, you know, they, I think it's really cool that one of the things I'm excited about, even though I haven't played. You know, I hardly ever play Constructed, as most people know about me. But back in the day, in like 2004, I played a Goblin deck and Extended. And with Goblin Matron printed now and Siege Gang Commander recently and Goblin Pile Driver reprinted too, almost that whole deck is legal and modern now. So <laughs> it might be interesting oh, yeah. to <laughs> try to make it work there. But uh, uh, yeah, but Goblins are definitely the red-black archetype. So that's another tribal color pair. And a thing I think they did that's interesting design-wise, although I'm interested to see how that particular color pair pans out, is that the black-white color pair is changelings. It kind of, it's sort of a bridge between, uh, you know, we've got the ninjas and the goblins and the slivers, and um, it overlaps a little bit with all of them, potentially. Um, and they will all have whatever creature type you need them to, whether it's ninja, goblin, or sliver. But I'm kind of curious to see how that pan is it only sort of going to be like supporting those tribal decks or is it really going to be its own deck? And that'll be interesting because the changeling deck, like what does that even what does that even mean? I mean, there's some interesting design space they could explore there, but I I'm curious to see how that pans out. Yeah, I was kind of impressed by how elegant a design that could possibly be, because it kind of means if you stay open and go for the changeling strategy, you can kind of side your way in you know, to one of the other tribes or pick up, you know, some really good cards like that Dregscape Sliver that I mentioned that gives all your changelings unearth for two, which is pretty darn good, especially with some of the changelings we've seen. I feel like it kind of leaves you open to go with that. Or like we said, there's the goblins or there's even squirrels <laughs> as another tribe. And, yeah, there's uh, some squirrel support. Yeah, it kind of lets you pick up those tech cards. And as long as you've got a pretty critical mass of changelings, you're going to get all those tribal synergies without having to try as hard to, you know, go into one of those color pairs or, you know, you can kind of do more mixing and matching, which I think kind of adds a interesting dynamic, you know, to your draft portion where you're going to have to keep an eye out for where you can pick up changelings to fill in those empty slots that you sometimes get when you're trying to go for the tribal draft and come up a little short yeah i mean it could really mean that you can really get there in all of these tribes because you can just fill it in with you know some of the changelings we've seen aren't anything special you know like two mana for a three one but it's got changeling so it's whatever you need it to be and yeah i mean that can make your deck when you're like okay i have this many goblin payoffs but sometimes you know in limited when there's a tribe like that you're like but i only have 
you know, five or six goblins. But it seems like in this set, it'll be pretty easy to get to sort of the, the you know, where you really want to get to of 10 if, you know, you're picking up changelings along the way. Yeah, and like the slivers are kind of the great enabler for that because you get things like tempered sliver. Uh, slivers, so it's two and a green. Uh, sliver creatures you control have whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, put a plus one plus one counter on it. That's kind of awesome, you know, for any kind of creature. And the fact that it can be a changeling and not necessarily, you know, just a uh, another sliver really opens it up so that you can pull together those kind of strategies a lot easier than you normally might be able to. Yeah. Yeah, the whole changeling thing, I'm interested to see how that pans out. It definitely looks interesting. One of the things that slivers do have going for them, even though I'm not the biggest fan, and maybe this is why, is every sliver is simultaneously a sliver and a sliver payoff. Uh, that's not something most other <laughs> creature types can say. So in limited, that does give them some help, though, because sometimes you're trying to build a tribe and it doesn't come together because you don't get the payoffs or you don't get the right number of creatures. Slivers are always both. Also, to note, uh, so far we've only seen uh, uncommon slivers. I don't think we've seen any common ones yet. That could be part of the design of the set, as well as that we're only going to get uncommon rare slivers so that you can't quite, you know, just jam all the crazy slivers and get the super huge payoffs like you would in Constructed, which would be interesting because then they act more like an anthem, you know, for all your changelings or, you know, things like that, rather than, you know, just this degenerate, you know, tribal deck that you can pick up and put together real easy. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that at least in red and white, there are going to be common slivers. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not saying there won't be any, but I'm just saying like, you know, the crazy five color sliver deck probably won't be a oh, thing on its own. No, probably not. And people probably. are going to be stealing the ones that aren't just red, white, you know, for their changelings and things like that. So, yeah. Yep, that's true. One of the ones I'm interested in is the blue green color pair, which looks like it's going to be snow. You know, snow is kind of a weird thing from long ago in Magic. Uh, Ice Age, one of its earliest expansions, had a snow super type um, where you had creatures and you had lands, lands that were snow covered, creatures that have a snow type. Um, and this sounds kind of weird, but I think it makes if you've played more recently, like in uh, Amonkhet, where we had deserts, um, I think I think the design can be similar to that, where you have creatures that give you payoffs for having enough snow stuff going on. Um, and we've already seen a lot of that stuff spoiled, which I think is really interesting. Uh, we've seen a lot of snow already spoiled, um, including non-basic, you know, snow lands that can turn into creatures. You know, creature lands are great. Uh, snow mana is a thing. You know, if a snow permanent, whether it's a creature that's a mana dork or a land, produces mana, it can produce snow mana, which sometimes other cards will ask you to pay for. And, you know, this goes further into telling you how complex this set is because they have a whole super type on top of all of these other um, crazy things that are going on uh, mechanically. But I think uh, snow has always interested me uh, back in Cold Snap, uh, which is the most recent set that had snow stuff in it. Um, it was kind of fun to mess around with. And there's going to be good snow payoffs. And all I, th I believe all the lands in this set in the booster packs are snow lands. So you have to sort of the way you do with deserts, you have to sort of uh, figure out when you need them and why you need them. The thing they don't have going for them that deserts had is that deserts could uh, cycle themselves uh, always. And uh, these can't. But uh, still, uh, you'll have to keep in mind that you might need snow lands. And I think that adds an interesting dimension to draft. Oh, definitely. And Holy cow, did they start with a really great one as far as the first snow creature that got revealed, which is Ice Fang Quaddle, a green and a blue, just two mana. And it's a 1-1 one, one flash flying Elvish Mystic. So when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. And as long as you have three or more snow permanents, it has Death Touch. So basically, we're getting flash baleful Strix as long as you can meet that you know, minimum requirement on the snow permanents. But even if you don't, it's you can still get it Death Touch by playing you know, another Snowland or even the other one that they did uh, that they showed the Abominable Tree Folk, which is two green blue trample and it's a star star. So it's power and toughness are each equal to the number of snow permanents you control. And when it enters the battlefield, you tap a creature an opponent controls and it doesn't untap during its next untap step. Those are some mad value cards. <laughs> Holy cow. Yep. And then there's Glacial Revelation. Reveal the top six cards of your library. Sorcery, two and a green. You may put any number of snow permanent cards from among them into your hand. So if you have dense enough snow permanents, this being a divination isn't extreme. And maybe sometimes you'll even draw three off of it, which would be great. So 
Yeah, that's pretty crazy. I think uh, value players are definitely going to be going for the snow when possible, because so far, you know, those are a couple of pretty great uh, creature, you know, payoffs. We're just picking up a few snow lands here and there. Yep, I think I think snow looks like a lot of fun. Um, and it's one we've seen before, but not in a really, really long time, just like ninjas, which I think are a fun uh, thing to see uh, that we haven't seen in a really, really long time. So, yeah, the archetypes, you know, they're they definitely look uh, interesting. I'm curious to see going forward, you know, as we're recording this, we don't know much about what ninjas will look like. We're sort of excited based on what they've done before. Uh, but I think I think having a mix of these tribal archetypes plus changelings plus all these wacky things like snow going on. Uh, I think all of that seems like it's, it looks like a fun format and most of these sets tend to be. So I don't think it's a stretch to think that they're on the right track for another really fun uh, innovation format. Yep. And then now that we've discussed the archetypes, maybe we can just call out some of the, you know, the more fun cards that we've seen. Uh, are there any that really jumped out at you as just being awesome? Well, I'm already, I am already mentioned I'm really excited about Goblin Matron, and obviously that's not awesome, but it is a card in Limited that I think is an interesting little payoff. Um, it's too generic in a red for a 1-1 Goblin, and when she enters the battlefield, you get to tutor up any Goblin in your deck and put it into your hand. So her stats are bad and all that, and she's not a bomb or anything. But if your deck has enough Goblins in it, and she is 3-mana 1-1 draw Goblin, that's, that's a pretty good little Limited card, um, and the kind I'm looking forward to playing with, at least. Well, and if you get a really good changeling, turns out right. you can and tutor up changelings. So, you know, that might yep. even be a edge case thing where, you know, you get a little extra value out of it. One that jumped out at me was Collected Conjuring. Seems kind of fun. I mean, it's going to be mm. a little too hard, I think, in most cases. I mean, if you heard our last episode, I think we discussed how we both really like blue-red spells decks. And there's definitely, like... It might not be one of the official archetypes, but blue red spells is always an archetype and limited for the most part. And it seems to be the case here as well. Uh, this one is two blue red sorcery. Exile the top six cards of your library. You may cast up to two sorcery cards with converted mana cost three or less from among them without paying their mana costs. Put the exile cards not cast this way on the bottom of your library in a random order. So it could be really yeah, good value. It looks wacky. It's also a card that's a good indicator of something else this set is doing, which is like calling back lots of cards. This one's a reference to Collected Company, instant that costs three and a green that lets you look at the top six cards of your library. And in that case, you get creatures with converted mana cost three or less and put them into play. And so this card sort of references that while being its own thing. It is interesting to me. It only lets you do it with sorceries. So that's something in limited you'll... In limited, you usually end up with a mix of instants and sorceries. But for this to work in limited, you'll have to have lots and lots of sorceries, which may or may not be possible. But I like the design of the card. I like that it's a callback. And if you can make it work in limited consistently, it's going to be pretty sweet. Yeah. And another one that's a callback to a you know previous card, Pondering Mage. Basically, you get to cast Ponder, you know, with a three, four body for five mana, which, you know, it's a little high cost, but... You know, Ponder is pretty sweet, <laughs> stable to a body, so... Um. Yeah, I mean, it's really sweet. For If that were a common in a, like, normal set, I mean, this set's going to have jacked-up power level, obviously, enough, because it's one of these innovation sets, but if this were a common in a regular set, even if it was just 5 mana, 3, 4, draw a card, that would be a really, really good common. This one is even better than that, because you get some card selection, and you get the 3, 4 body, so... Yeah, it looks like it's going to be quite good. Could also be a good thing to uh, attack with and your opponent takes it and you ninja to a ninja into play and then you get to play your pondering mage again. So that sounds like fun to me. Yep. And we even got Mana War. Oh, I love Mana War. <laughs> yeah, every time they print a Mana War, I'm always happy. And this one is just literal Mana War. So that's good. Pretty incredible. Not quite a little Teferi, but pretty close. <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty close. I was just going to say another common that I see as very likely one of the better commons around uh, for its color is Mother Bear for green, which, you know, it's early to say this, but obviously they're usually, you know, some, it's easy to tell what's going to be a really strong common in a limited format. I think this will be because it's a bear, of course, flavor. It's a two mana, two, two. But once it's in the graveyard, also flavor, since it's a mother bear, uh, you can exile her for three and a green, two green, and you get two bear tokens. And that's, you know, that is the potential to be a three for one. And you know how much I love those. Yeah, I love the uh, the fun theme that we got with the green tokens, because we not only got bear tokens, we also got squirrel tokens. 
and deep forest hermit is going to be a beating sometimes when it <laughs> when you're able to pick it up yeah yeah it's another card that's a callback i can't exactly remember the name of the card that it's a uh, callback deranged to. hermit is the deranged original hermit yeah yeah squirrel lords yeah it's it's pretty wacky fun to have one of those uh yeah i mean it's a it's a the the great thing about a card like this is that it's a squirrel lord as we've referenced but it makes squirrels when it comes into play so you don't need to have anything else going on because when it comes into play it makes four one one squirrels and that means for five mana you're getting uh nine nine worth of stats is that did i get the math right there yep that's pretty crazy and if you blink deep forest hermit you get another four squirrels so <laughs> there's a lot and you of... may want to blink it because it has vanishing three which means it's gonna disintegrate eventually and you'll still keep the squirrels if they're alive but you'll lose the uh the anthem for them yeah and we do have a way to blink as well uh might be a little hard to pull together uh, there, i'm sure there will be other blink spells as well there usually are but uh astral drift whenever you cycle astral drift or cycle another card while astral drift is on the battlefield you can exile to our creature if you do return it uh back to the battlefield at the end at your end step and then it has cycling uh two and a white so yeah yeah that'll yeah, be a really awesome. sweet one to pick up for sure yeah because there's a lot of it's you. a reference to astral slide another old card it does something very similar but it's it's a really cool build around. Um, I think this format will probably have plenty of cycling in it. Uh, cycling is always a great mechanic in limited just because it helps you if you're flooding. out. I mean, if, if you're uh, not hitting your mana drops and you desperately have to cycle something, you can. Or if you really need to dig for something, you can. And, and in this case, it still does something when you cycle it, which is great. And then, yeah, the fact they can just blink your creatures over and over again is pretty awesome um so blue white in general uh as they announced earlier today is a blink archetype that's where the most of that looks like it'll be happening yep and just one last one that i wanted to note a eula queen among bears that card is amazing <laughs> it's been a joke for a really long time with the limit or uh, loading ready run uh they had a joke about bear tribal and now we have a legit legendary creature bear and it kind of rocks it's one in the green uh whenever another bear enters the battlefield under your control you can put two one one counters on the bear or have it fight another creature you don't control or have a bear that you control fight another creature you don't control so that thing could be incredible especially if you get the other bear rares but obviously it's not with another bear you know that that's a common and it just you know makes three bears all on its own so that's (laughs) true yeah and if you have the eula out you get two five five or two four four bears instead or any what other was the other legendary bear we recently gore claw that was his name yeah gore gore claw. Claw. Yep. but he's not he doesn't care about bears weirdly he cares about bigger creatures um <laughs> yep but uh ayula actually cares about bears the creature type which is cool people in edh will be happy about that and we got ayula's influence which is a green 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 enchantment and you can just discard a land card whenever you feel like it and create a 2-2 green bear creature token so <laughs> if you somehow get those two in the same draft you could just be off to the races with like the craziest tribal deck ever <laughs> as long as yeah, you that can would be a lot of fun that's for sure keep it going uh, yeah. that one's a reference to seismic assault uh which you know all so many of these cards are references it's crazy um and they're all done pretty well they're all pretty fun yeah, and also just a note from the Vorthos side of things, uh, you have a lot of like age progressed characters as well that are kind of showing up. Like Ranger Captain of Eos is kind of an older version of Ranger of Eos. Oh, um, I didn't. I saw the card and I got the reference, but I didn't get that it was literally the same guy but older. Yeah, and like we got seasoned Pyromancer, which is grown up young Pyromancer. That's cool. I think that might be it. And then obviously there's some, you know, callbacks to old characters and like. You know, Giver of Runes is kind of like Mother of Runes, but not a human so that people didn't flip out. Ravenous Giant <laughs> is basically functionally a reprint of Juzam Jin, but yep. in red. Um, uh, like Umazawa's Charm is basically a instant, you know, black spell that does what Umazawa's Jite does. Um, yeah, one time. what One counter on Umazawa's Jite can do. Yeah, <laughs> it can do it once. Again, as an instant. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And then uh, we got Sarah, who has been a character in magic lore for a very, very long time. And people have always wanted a card. Now she gets to be the first Planeswalker that we've seen. Only one so far, but I I guarantee there should be more Planeswalkers considering the uh, Planebound Accomplice, (laughs) which, you know, 
That card does not seem very good as of right now because basically it's a two and a red, one three, and you can pay a red to put a Planeswalker card onto the battlefield and then sack it at the end of the next end step, which so far there's only one Planeswalker that you probably don't even want to use the ability on because she's not that great <laughs> if you're just going to sacrifice her. Yeah, you want to use her more and she's not expensive or anything. She's, yeah, uh, I think I could be wrong, but I think Mark Rosewater said there's only one other Planeswalker, like your typical oh, really? set. Only oh. two, yeah. That card, I mean, you know, doesn't have to make sense in Limited, and it, it doesn't sound like it will. Uh, but it it's definitely an interesting design and not one we've seen before for Planeswalkers. Oh, yeah, and then, of course, one of our earliest spoilers, Cabal Therapist, who is a callback to Cabal Therapy, the spell. Um, yep. Which that that's card one looks where, pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's one where, like, I did actually catch the art thing, where, like, if you go to Cabal Therapy... And look at the art. There's like a dude torturing a guy and it's a card that it's a discard spell, uh, to put it briefly. And Cabal Therapist is like the actual guy, the actual sort of horror who's torturing the guy on Cabal Therapy. So he's the yeah, I'm curious to see if we see more cards that have names like that. I don't think any at this point have been spoiled, but I think, you know, lots of other references have been, but not one that's like straight up sort of the noun version uh, or I guess the the human or uh, creature based noun version of an older like sorcery that we saw. And we already mentioned Pondering Mage is kind of the other one that we've seen so oh, far. Oh, yeah, that's good call. Um, yeah. And of note, if you didn't realize, um, I have actually animated both Sarah and Cabal Therapist back when I <laughs> still had time for that sort of thing. Uh, so if you do look at my YouTube account, you can see my animations of those if you're interested. Yeah, the the Cabal Therapist one's scary, so be warned. It is pretty scary. <laughs> oh, and then, of course, the granddaddy of them all, Urza, Lord High Artificer. That card just looks insane bonkers. Um, I don't even remember if it's that great and limited. I don't think it is, it's, right? It's probably it's probably going to be all right and limited. Um, I yeah. mean, he's a four mana one four who at worst is a four mana one four who makes a one one. And that one one can tap to add blue to your mana to your mana pool. That's, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, even from that perspective, it's really not yeah, terrible. Even, I mean, you can do all kinds of silly things elsewhere because the creature he makes, which is a reference to Karn, I think, because um, he's the guy who made Karn. The creature he makes gets bigger the more artifacts you have. And then he has an ability, too, where you shuffle your library and exile the top card. And you can play that card without paying its mana cost. So even on his own, in limited, he's going to be pretty great, I think. Um, that five mana activated ability one is especially uh, just can generate card advantage quickly. So even if you have zero artifacts in your deck, I think Urza is pretty great in limited. And if you have a bunch, then he gets to be silly. Oh, and... Probably about time that we move on to recall, but the last one is a bizarre trade mage. He does the bizarre Baghdad activated ability. Yeah, I'm glad they made him a little expensive-ish for the sake of people who hate Dredge, because <laughs> yeah. Dredge is already strong enough, I think. And uh, if they decided to make him like a two mana zero one with flying, I feel like that would actually be a lot better for them than a three mana three four with flying in the bizarre Baghdad effect. Yeah, it's a note, though. He is actually going to be pretty darn good and limited, though. A three mana, three, four flyer that lets you. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Draw two and then discard three. It good might sound bad on paper to people, but the fact that you get that much card selection is pretty great. Yeah, I mean, there will be times where casting him is obnoxious, but the fact that he is always almost always going to be relevant because of those stats means you know, you don't have to play him at a time when maybe you have like one card in your hand. So you're just going to have to discard everything. You can you can hold off on it. But uh, frequently, you know, even if you have two cards in your hand and you only get to hold on to one in the end, the extra cards you're drawing and getting digging into it is pretty nice. So, yeah. All right. Well, we will talk about more of these hopefully next week. Uh, but for the time being, that is what we know so far about Modern Horizons. So. What are we going to talk about on Recall this week? Well, uh, last time on Recall, we talked about sort of the crazy 1993 degenerate magic 40 card decks. You could play as many copies of whatever you wanted. We talked about some of the stupid things people could do that made the game kind of uninteresting. And I also mentioned that the DCI was eventually created in early 1994, and they came in and regulated the game, restricted things to four cards, some cards to one, like the Power Nine, 
banned some things, 60 card decks, all of these things that we think of today as part of Magic. And they did all of this because later that year in August of 1994 was the first time Wizards was going to have a sanctioned tournament. It's really the first, uh, it's not technically a pro tour yet, that doesn't come till a little bit later, but it's the first Magic World Championship. It's the first tournament where Wizards was like promoting it and saying this is a tournament that we're putting on. Anybody can come and play. What we're going to talk about in this edition of Recall is some of the silly things that were still around, even though they tried to fix some things, and they did fix things. By the time things got to August, things had been repaired to the point that Magic at least resembled the game we know now. But there are still some silly things that happened uh, at the tournament, so I was going to tell a couple stories. So I think it's important to note that we have a really interesting source for this particular tournament by the guy who won it. Uh, named Zach Dolan, who wrote a journal all about his experiences. Uh, he, who, and he's the guy who won the very first Magic World Championship. What do you think the prize was for the very first Magic World Championship? Ooh, <laughs> I, I almost wanted to say that I knew it just based on seeing some old uh, or some Enter the Battlefields that, you know, covered earlier events in Magic history. But I think I might be getting that confused with one of the like the very first Magic tournaments, uh, which was like a play set of Arabian Nights, but I think that was the first tournament that Brian David Marshall put on at Neutral Grounds in New York and not the World. So I'm going to say that Worlds was a thousand dollars. You're pretty much right, actually. Um, it was about a thousand dollars worth of cards is what Zach Dolan says. <laughs> uh, he, he got like a T-shirt and some other stuff. And, you know, when he when this journal got published, which I think was in 2004, even by then, like with the world championship winner got like thirty thousand dollars. Now, of course, you get more money than that. So, yeah, obviously, magic has changed. But the interesting thing about this world is that anybody could go as long as you showed up, you could play. And in the end, 512 players showed up from all over the world uh, with France, Belgium, the United States really having the biggest sort of representation at the time. One thing that's interesting about it that would, I think, make a lot of people cringe today because of the way we all know Magic has variants in it is that it was single elimination. If you lost, oh, wow. you were out. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. So it was the best of three. So that was a thing. But still, you, it was single elimination. So before we get to talking about one story in particular at, at Worlds, I tell a story related to uh, the night before Worlds. This story involves one of Magic's earliest mechanics, one that was quickly abandoned, called Anti. When Richard Garfield originally designed the game, it involved both players putting a random card from their deck into an Anti zone. Then whoever wins that game wins the cards in the Anti zone. You don't only lose a game of Magic if you lose, you lose a card, a random card from your deck, which could very well be a really important card for your deck. Like a Black um, Lotus, let's say. <laughs> I like wonder, Black Lotus, yeah, let's say. How many say. people do you think lost Black Lotuses to Anti? A lot, probably, Oof. because that's how a lot of people played the game in the early going. Yeah, that must have been awful. And I'm sure, again, like we talked about last week, I'm sure there are plenty of people with their I lost a Black Lotus to Anti stories, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, probably. I mean, especially yeah, to, to losing things to anti sounds especially horrible because it means you also lost the game. <laughs> so yep. and you lose the card and the game. And there were crazy cards that could interact with the anti zone. The most broken of which is contract from below, which was one black mana for a sorcery. It says discard your hand, anti the top card of your library, then draw seven cards. <laughs> wow. So, <laughs> so for one black mana for a card like this, uh, you drew seven cards. So Ancestral Recall is strong. The downside here is you put another card into the ante. So if you lose, now you're losing two cards. So <laughs> that could go badly. But that goes to show you how they messed around with this idea of ante really early on. When the DCI comes into existence in January of 1994, they ban all the ante cards. They do this for a few reasons. One of which is it was bad PR. How many parents are going to want their kids playing a game that has really obvious gambling in it? Not really veiled gambling. There's basically gambling at the beginning of the game. Another reason is that it wasn't very much fun. And then yet another reason is if it is gambling they'd have to deal with a lot more regulation so it gets pushed out of the game quickly but by the time of worlds while it's banned and people aren't playing it at the tournament the night before apparently a lot of the world's players decided they were going to play anti-games against each other and the night before the tournament french and belgian players who at the time from the perspective of zach dolan at least he says they're the best in the world they had the reputation as the most intimidating players there 
part of the reason for this is because they had already had national tournaments there and there hadn't been one yet in the United States. There was sort of a more organized tournament scene that emerged there before it did here, which I think is especially interesting. Cards were only in English at this time for the most part. So, but the the point is that these French and Belgian players challenged a bunch of American players to anti-games. And Zach says many pieces of the Power Nine were won by these players from American players during anti-games the very night before Worlds. Oh, no. And that's right. that's just crazy. Like, oh, why would you put so much on the line like that? <laughs> just like, yeah, it's not like today where you can go to a tournament and pick up cards like, yeah, the prices are inflated. But most of the time, you know, since Channel Fireball hosts, you know, most GPs and bigger tournaments, you can go buy cards from a vendor at the tournament. But I bet you back then the vendors probably didn't have a lot of stock or they weren't even at these tournaments just yet. Yeah. I mean, and, and it almost sounds like something out of like Yu-Gi-Oh, where like you you're playing the the big tournament starts the next day but a major game is played between you and your rival and whoever wins gets the best card from the other and this is especially this is some serious value for these french and belgian players because not only are they winning power nine and other powerful cards from their american opponents they're making it so like you said they don't have those cards in their deck the next day so they're making it so that they are easier to beat the next day by beating them the night before in these probably ill-advised anti-games. You know, imagine something like that happening today, like people facing off against each other and having to give up their best card if they lose the night before. It would it would not be considered good. Like Even if you challenge someone to a, a contest like this the night before, it would be considered really bad manners. Uh, but back then, you know, it was just part of the game, even though Wizards had sort of said, actually, it isn't. But uh, these players the night before decided it would be fun to play for anti. I and mean, that's part of why I love hearing stories like this, because I actually did not know about this one. And that is just great. <laughs> like, I love that that kind of thing happened. Because, again, it's so irresponsible when you're about to go into this big tournament. You know, if you want to win, you don't want to be giving away your best cards. But at the same time, it's kind of a great story. So, I yeah, guess it's a crazy story. It's a crazy story, to be sure. And you definitely don't want to be giving up your best cards. I mean, the whole Power Nine is legal at this tournament as one of. So if and if you lose one of them. That's probably the only copy you have. (laughs) So good luck, like you said, finding them for the next day. So as Worlds began, you know, it was a single elimination to begin with. Eventually it gets down to 64 players um, and they sort of get divided into two brackets. And then eventually it gets down to the top four. And when it gets to that top four, there's one American left and that's Zach Dolan. The most interesting story to me that comes from Worlds, it relates specifically to one card, one card that just as weird as the anti-card sound to us today, I think these cards might sound just as strange. And the card in particular that I'm talking about is called Chaos Orb. Oh, yeah, that is probably one of my favorite just like old goofy cards. If you don't know, basically you take the card and it's actually a physical skill test, which is among the cards that got banned uh, pretty early on because it's a a little tough to expect players to be able to do something like a Chaos Orb where you have to toss the card up in the air and then whatever it lands on gets destroyed, which led to like crazy strategies back then where you'd actually spread your cards out in a certain way so that they could only hit one thing with your Chaos Orb, (laughs) which is just kind of hilarious as far as like a metagame goes. But at the same time, you can see why it probably ended up on the ban restricted list for a pretty good reason. Yeah, and it had been restricted. Like Wizards already was concerned about this card. And in particular, it's not just that Chaos Orb's wacky, you know, it's that it's actually super powerful. It's two mana for an artifact. You pay one and you sacrifice it and flip it onto the battlefield. And everything it touches, as Mike said, gets destroyed. So worst case scenario, you're p- probably playing paying three mana to destroy a permanent. And if you're especially good at flipping these cards, and players at the time were, I mean, this was a skill you had to have. You had to practice this very skill uh, to, to succeed sometimes in Magic. And luckily the card got restricted to one copy from four, by worlds and so you could only have the one copy but basically everyone had the one copy because it's so powerful i mean if you can control what you're destroying with this fairly well i mean three mana to destroy a permanent is a pretty good rate and if you hit more than one thing um things get to be pretty silly there's chaos orb is the really powerful one of these they're sort of collectively referred to as uh, dexterity cards chaos orb being one falling star is the other one both uh, eventually get banned, but they're not banned at Worlds in 1994. 
And that leads to some sort of wacky uh, situations. And in general, like this sort of effect sounds like it would be in an unset, you know, not at Magic's highest level at Worlds in 1994. Yeah, now I'm just imagining that you have like a Tanya Harding type situation where somebody like runs up and smacks somebody's fingers with a baseball bat so they can't so they can't do the chaos orb flip properly or yeah, well, okay that's the, probably way too old of a reference for most of our listeners so how about this i don't know they made a movie they made a movie about her recently that's true yeah <laughs> or at that anti match the night before i just imagine them in like a cd like you know underground you know basement with you know smoke filtering through the air and you know, while these guys are playing anti matches in the background, people are playing the knife game, you know, where you like stick the knife in between your fingers going as fast <laughs> yeah. as you can. And then one guy like, you know, misses and loses a finger and now he's going to lose because he can't do the chaos flip. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, yeah, no, oh. it's that's definitely true. And part of the problem with the card is not just that it does something sort of wacky. It's that the rules for what either player can do aren't clearly laid out on the card. So at Worlds, some of the things you'd have people try to do are move their cards out of the way while the card is being flipped. A ruling had to be made at Worlds saying you can't move your cards while the card's being flipped, which sounds obvious to us today, but it doesn't say anything about that on the card. It just says flip it. Uh, it doesn't say your opponent can't move their cards. As yeah. Mike said, people would space their cards out into really crazy board states that causes its own set of problems, taking up an excessive amount of space. If one card that's restricted is causing people to play the game, literally sort of reshape their boards for the sake of the card, obviously that's a problem. But the story that's probably the most entertaining to me from the tournament regarding Chaos Orb involves the 1994 French national champion Bertrand Lestray. And this guy ran 61 cards in his deck, which to us today, that's, you know, like a noob move. Like, why would you do that? You're decreasing the consistency of your deck, right? Well, he ran 61 cards for a reason. He had his one copy of Chaos Orb, and he had heard a story, and many Magic players had at this point. I think it may be apocryphal. I couldn't actually find the original story, only players saying they'd heard the story. But in this story, somebody takes their Chaos Orb, and rips it into confetti, basically, and throws it onto the battlefield. And now the Chaos Orb, obviously, can hit more permanents, and it nukes the entire board. Someone, some apocryphal person somewhere did this. And the reason Bertrand Lestray decides to run 61 cards in his deck is because one of them is Chaos Orb, and he wants to have in his back pocket the ability to rip it up if he needs to and still have a legal 60-card deck. So... <laughs> Oh, wow. Talk about upping the ante. <laughs> now you're right. actually destroying yeah. a card. <laughs> yeah, oh, he's man. actually willing to physically destroy his card because he thinks it will give him an advantage, which, you know, I think isn't that strange for Magic at the time. Unfortunately for him, uh, at one point during the tournament, he asked a judge who was there. There are judges at this point very early on uh, in the judge program. And the judge said you couldn't do that. Uh, the judge said you couldn't rip the card up and throw it on the battlefield. In the end, he had a 61 card deck and he never got to rip up his Chaos Orb. One of the things that interests me, though, about you know this story with Bertrand Lestray and relating to Zach Dolan is that other players at the time, they didn't like the card. you know, So it wasn't like everybody loved it and thought it was cool. Uh, Zach Dolan, for example, kept one in his sideboard. And he says the whole reason he had it there was to side it in against Bertrand to say... You know, you're going to use your Chaos Orb, I'm going to use mine. In a way, uh, Zach Dolan basically hints that he thinks it's unsporting to use a card like Chaos Orb. He doesn't think it should be part of the game, but because Bertrand Lestrand does it, he's going to do it if he has to. So it's only in his sideboard. But it goes to show you that even though some players may have been willing to go to ripping their deck apart, you know, if they could, if they could get an advantage, other players thought the card was unfair even then and didn't like the design to begin with. Yeah, and I feel like even nowadays you still see a little bit of that sometimes with pros that refuse to, you know, go with the tier one deck, you know, even though past, especially pretty recently, we've had some decks that are, you know, just completely degenerate, like during the energy crisis with uh, <laughs> things like uh, either Works Marvel and all the really parasitic energy mechanics. We still had people like Craig Wesco out there doing their mono white, you know, <laughs> strategies and things like that, so... Uh, you definitely see a little bit of that chivalry, you know, nowadays even. Oh, man. Yeah, but can you think of can you think of someone who would only side in a card against someone they know is mainboarding that same card because they think that card's degenerate? Uh, 
not nowadays, but hey, if anybody out there has those stories, those are the kind of things we want to know. So, you know, definitely That's let Nitsuhon know if you if you have heard any of those stories or have a good source for them. If um, you're that person also who tore up your chaos orb and threw it on the battlefield, um, that would be interesting to know where that story originates from. Because, as I said, I've seen people talk about it. There's even an uncard, I think an unglued, the first unset that references it called Chaos Confetti. <laughs> which tells you to rip up the card there, literally. But I couldn't find uh, anybody who actually knew who did it originally. So, But it would be interesting to find out who it was. Oh, yeah, I would love to interview you because that would be pretty cool because that is definitely one of those vaunted stories, you know, from Magic's past. I, I actually didn't realize that Chaos Orb was ever played at a tournament, so <laughs> that's kind of oh, great. Yeah. It only got restricted in 1994, and it wouldn't get banned, I don't think, until 1995. They banned it before Worlds next year because of the, you know, the the biggest problems it caused at Worlds were just that people's board states were so, uh, they had to, you know, they would even spread their lands out. Everything, uh, if we remember to, we'll actually link to a, a, a picture or two that are actually around from Worlds where you can see how people had their cards uh, spread out just to try to avoid Chaos Orb from blowing up more than one permanent. And yeah, eventually Chaos Orb and Falling Star, these two dexterity cards would be banned. And they are among the very, very small list of cards, along with the anti cards, which we mentioned earlier, that would remain banned forever, basically, from being banned in even in Vintage. Vintage is a format that doesn't have a ban list mostly. Most things are just restricted. But the dexterity cards and the anti cards are entirely banned, showing you that Wizards is sort of saying, this isn't part of the game in any format, even in its most degenerate, powerful format. We don't want dexterity cards or anti-cards. So I think that's an interesting decision on their part. And I think one I'm thankful for in the long run. Yeah, like those mechanics are great for like an unset. And we've actually seen, you know, some dexterity mechanics that even showed up in the most recent unset, Unstable. Uh, you had things like a hazmat suit, where if you touched it, you had to discard it or something like that. Like you could use you couldn't use anything or you couldn't use your hands. You had to use other objects to push it around because it's toxic. <laughs> so that's a fun one. Yeah. And there's like a goblin that has flying as long as you hold it above the table and that sort of thing. So, yeah, like that stuff's fun for casual and you could still play with those in casual. But at a tournament, uh, I don't know if you've been to a big magic tournament recently, your listener, but there's not a lot of space. <laughs> <And> <laughs> if you thought Dryad Arbor was a big controversy, I can't imagine how those sorts of people would flip out based on I'm going to tap the mountain that is on my shoulder because I've got it up here so that you can't hit it with my <laughs> chaos or with your chaos orb. And I'll tap the island that is over on my opponent's battle <laughs> play mat. Like, oh, yeah, that must have. I feel like they probably saw the writing on the wall there and went, yeah, we can't let people keep doing these sort of things. That would just. Yeah, I mean, they already knew it was a problem. They already didn't love the idea. That's why they restricted it. But back then, just like with Vintage today, they tried their hardest not to ban anything. The only things really that had been banned that were banned in 1994 were cards were anti cards and cards that like ruined the game, like Shaharazad, which is a ridiculous card that basically makes you leave the game you have in front of you. Go play a side game with your opponent using what's left of your decks from the first game. Then whoever wins that side game loses half of their, well, whoever loses it loses half of their life. And then you go back and you finish your other game. Which and is so, so inconsequential in the grand scheme of things even. <laughs> right. And it just made games last forever and it wasn't very much fun. And so they banned that, not, be, you know, because just like sort of like the dexterity cards, they didn't want it being part of the game at all. And Time Vault also gets banned before 1994 because it's viewed as too easy to abuse basically a two card combo to take infinite turns, but everything else is only restricted. I mean, you got to remember Black Lotus is restricted, right? Not Chaos Orb. Uh, I mean, and, and you know, Chaos Orb is also restricted is what I mean to say, you know, and so they don't want to ban a card like Chaos Orb when Black Lotus and Ancestral Recall and Time Walk are legal, but eventually they did. And again, yeah, I think we're all thankful for it and we're glad that they decided dexterity cards were in the realm only of unformats yeah just for fun well that was a really great story <laughs> uh thanks for sharing that one i had no idea i still no just problem. love the degenerate anti playing before a big tournament that is 
so great <laughs> and if you yeah it's, if you're around those tournaments definitely hit us up and let us know if you have any more details or stories uh, you know from those uh, especially if it's a horrific story where bertrand lestray won your black lotus from you or something and oh man yeah <laughs> or if anybody was actually doing the knife game thing and screwed up their uh chaos or flip the next day that would be tragic and hilarious <laughs> at the same time it's just it's just crazy to me to imagine people like magic players sitting at a table figuring out the perfect way to flip flip the chaos orb with the most control and things like this like that's just it just seems so alien to the game today but like that's what people were doing i mean oh, yeah. you, you wanted to get 100 percent out of your chaos orb and if you weren't practicing how to flip it correctly why play it so <laughs> yeah i'm just imagining people on like you know carpooling the tournaments and the guy in the passenger seat is sitting just sitting there going flip 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 <laughs> you know over and over again getting those getting those reps in on the chaos flip yeah and something to mention about the card that I, I think we forgot to mention is the card does itself say you have to flip it from a height of at least one foot and it has to turn over it completely at least once during the flip so it's not like you can just like plop it onto the battlefield you have to make sure that you are flipping it from high enough and that it's it's flipping or it doesn't actually do anything. If you that's I guess what the downside of it's supposed to be that if you're inept at flipping it, it does nothing and you just owe for one to yourself. You know, you, your chaos orb, you paid three mana total for it and it did nothing. Everybody knew how to do it correctly. So that's never what it did. Yep. Well, again, awesome story. Thank you for that neat zone. Just a little bit of housekeeping here. We should hopefully be recording again next week, but I do have a bit of a busy magic schedule actually for once uh i'm gonna be going to mcq up in chicago this weekend this podcast probably won't be out before then but hopefully this will be out before magic fest kansas city which is where i'll be going the next weekend if you're out there uh I've made some tokens that have a cute little fibble thip uh on him with a little army hat and he's it's an army token for War of the Spark. So if you want to grab one of those, you know, make sure and find me. I'll, I'll make sure and announce on Twitter, you know, where I am. So if you want to come grab one, it's got a little ad for the podcast on the back. And I might even give you a couple so you can hand them to your friends and things like that. Uh, so, yeah. Or if you just want to chat, I'll be around. So unfortunately, that does mean we'll, we'll see. I'm hoping I can still record, <laughs> but, you know, we'll make sure and let you know. Make sure you're following both of us on Twitter. I'm uh, at Mythic Tales Mike, and you're at Nitsahone Magic on there. Yep, at Nitsahone Magic. Yep. yep. And uh, I also have a Patreon, uh, you, which you can also find at Nitsahone underscore magic. So, you know, if you feel like you've gained anything from this content or any other content I produced, you can always think about, you know, throwing another dollar my way and helping uh, fund the continued creation of this content. Yep, I do not have one, but if you do want to help out the show in general, still just you know, send it Meets a Hone's way that'll let him know that this is going well and <laughs> we can keep putting more yeah, you know, more time and effort into making a cool podcast for you guys. So uh, thanks again for listening. Let's go out with a bang. Sit back and watch it burn.